to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal with your host, Kalin Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and corporate power. The thing is, though... If you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree to shop and nail it. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's all right, I choose to go my life too. That's okay. It means something, it means something. And they got away. You know, that's my take on it. Like, what's yours? Protonic River Song. That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed. It is a science thing. It is a science place. It is a scientific fact that we are all up in your face. It is time for the one, uh, the only protonic reversal. Welcome to WIT. Today we have very special guest, uh, Jennifer Finch of the incredible and the mighty L7. Uh, I'm very excited for this. This is going to be... It's going to be a blast. So just wanted to quick say thanks, everybody, for sharing the shows around. All, all the nice things everyone has said of late. Uh, it's um, it's very nice. Thank you. That's <laughs> I guess that's my take on it. Thank you. Remember, patreon.com slash Bratonic Reversal for the archives. And uh, to get the shows ahead of time, dollar a month will get you there. But the shows are always free at RadioNeutron.com, anywhere you get your podcasts. And um, yeah, what we're going to do right now is we're going we're gonna to dive right into it in this very special edition. Yet another quarantine edition of Proton Conversal. And we have none other than Jennifer Finch. Hello. None other. None other. None other. Ex- except Greetings. no substitute. It will Greetings. Not be Hello, welcome, welcome to the show. It's uh, I'm so glad you agreed to do this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm excited. Uh, so I think uh, what I've been doing with all these quarantine episodes, and with everything else going on, it's easy to forget that we are indeed in still in a quarantine and a global pandemic. I've, I've kind of been asking what, what I feel is kind of a lame question in normal times, which is how are you doing, but a very vital and important question also. Which, uh, how are you doing in these crazy times, Jennifer? We're doing good. Thank you so much for asking. How are you doing? Getting by. Doing, doing a lot of these shows, you know, trying to maintain sanity. I think anybody with an ounce of empathy is uh, having a rough time of things right now. Uh, right. And it's maddening on a daily basis. So I, I, for me, it's been like a bucket one, bucket two situation. Like, what can you affect and what can you not affect? And the stuff you can't affect, let's not have that drive you completely crazy to the point of wanting to murder people. So the wisdom to know the difference. Exactly. As the, as the, as the, as the saying goes. Yeah. As, I, yes. as the non-bastardized setting that I just like blatantly ripped off <laughs> right. actually goes. It is, it, it, it's interesting to be able to like come forward in a way that uh, just doesn't buy into protecting ourselves or making us feel better by dragging other things and yeah. stepping back and giving voice to other people and being able to, I don't know, I kind of, I'm like one of those people that right now thinks the world is like not upside down, but is actually tipping itself right side up after being upside down for so long. Mm. And, you know, how can we support other people in this? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's you know being something that yeah these these are not things that came out of nowhere. These were systemic problems right. that existed before, and they were problems we've all been talking about for a long time. Right, right. Uh, so uh, surprise! <laughs> it's my new spiritual principle of the year. It's like it's besides surprise. like honesty, open mindedness, hope. My it's the spiritual principle of surprise. surprise. <laughs> you didn't see say. it coming, did you? You didn't see it coming. <laughs> For twenty twenty, it's it. definitely a, a valid <laughs> spiritual principle. Surprise! Surprise! <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Please. Oh no! I please interrupt. Uh, yeah, and I think that it's something where. Huh, 
it's again they're not new problems uh what do you there's been some theories that you know if people hadn't been cooped up with uh, covid quarantine and stuff like that that maybe there would be less action on the streets and things along those lines do you feel like that might be accurate well, yeah i think that there's always different elements that come together Anytime that there's change in society, it's not the one thing or the one thought, and it's not the thinkers that change it. There's usually something that happens. There's disrest, and something is uncomfortable. Right. And so then... God, this this is getting pretty deep. Like I feel like we're we're getting uh, we're getting into, into some heady topics. But, I know. And but, back to the Melvins. Yeah, and yeah. Back to the Melvins. <laughs> How are they doing? <laughs> yeah, but no. It, I, I mean, I think it's it's disingenuous not to mention these kinds of things. Sure, sure. Yeah, and, and it's also hard for me. I am notoriously like a deep thinking, emotional person that has to take a lot of time out in life in order to like be able to just take steps forward. So sure. There we go. And, it's hard for me not to talk about and when, injustice. And when you're in a situation where everything kind of comes at you, uh, almost like a, uh, you know, a conveyor belt of uh, events, misery, tragedy, and, and, and surprise as we've now determined is, is the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the watch word. Uh, it can be difficult. It can be difficult to process that. I mean, it can, it can be difficult just for anyone to be able to do that. But if you're trying to literally do anything else other than process the day's events, it, it's overwhelming. And I think that's something that's a common. It's a common structure, and it's something that I kind of find a little enheartening. Kind of trying to turn it around uh, on the positive side that everyone's in the same boat. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. no, no one's having an easier time with this than anyone else that, that I'm aware of, you know, from the right. And ultimately we want, we all want the same thing. Right. And, and that, that goes a long way towards, I mean, hopefully building some degree of empathy, even if it's just like <laughs> at a baseline level to understand that, Hey, we're all humans. We're all dealing with this. Yeah. Incredibly screwed up situation often, but we always have to remember America is a special child and that we all come from places usually that we've been kicked out of or have had to leave because we haven't, we've had conflicting values. Absolutely. So we all historically came here. So we're a nation of rebellious children, <laughs> you know, some at times, <laughs> including myself, you know, and, uh, you know, we're here to, to figure this out. So I think it's all. Well, and that's definitely interesting yeah we, don't, we could do a whole sub show on on people acting act like rebellious children and, and the many, many manifestations <laughs> of that but i don't necessarily think if that's the best use of uh, of our time here excellent uh, i am very psyched on your photography work and i, f I find it so compelling that you've because uh, this is something you've been, you've been doing a lot of uh, you've been doing stuff with photography most of your life uh right yeah, let me just kind of, because I'm really in a state right now in in working with photography where I really do need to be able to have my elevator pitch on this and like what this is about. Pitch. So really what it's about is when I was 12 or 13, I really wanted to go to punk rock shows and I wanted to go experience all the stuff that I read in books. And I knew I probably wouldn't be allowed to do it unless there was some sort of side purpose. So I asked my father for a camera and I started photographing events around me. I, I was self-educated. I would just shoot a roll, look at it, look at other photographers, talk to other photographers, and then try to make this a thing. So I never was feet on the ground to become a photographer but i did end up shooting in the los An like los angeles through 1981 to i'm gonna say 1986 fairly Before regularly so time. I, I, there are a lot, lot of awesome yeah. things happening yeah lots of things happening so i was at those forming shows i had friends that were part of what later went on to sort of create 90s culture and um was part of that scene and photographed more from um, less from a photographer's point of view, but more from somebody that was a participant. 
in that scene. It was a, a little bit more like that. So a lot of my stuff is, yes, I have Black Flag. I have Circle Jerks. I have Red Hot Chili Peppers. I have Courtney Love as a teenager. I have all these things that people get kind of juiced up over. But what's what I'm passionate about from that time is just taking pictures of kids at parties, uh, street kids, yeah, you know, stuff on the streets. And it's not developed. It's not developed bodies of work that you see with a lot of photographers. It's amateur. It's very amateur. And in 2016, I went through my garage and I noticed that a lot of the film and Polaroids were falling apart. I did a Kickstarter to ask people to help me scan all this stuff. Um, I thought that I had around 8,000 negatives, which for a photographer is not that much. I mean, that's low. Um, I sent everything to India and, it, and I ended up having 12,000 negatives. <laughs> Wow. So I got so frustrated by that. I kind of it's quite a discrepancy. All, yeah, <laughs> learn to count, Finch. And you know, so it's been this slow grow of pulling this stuff out and dating it and pulling together archives. In that time, I've become an expert at archiving, and I've started to understand the importance of curation and what it means for bodies of work for artists and other artists and photographers. So I've kind of jumped into that last year. I decided I've never got my undergrad. I've never completed college. So I went back last year because I wanted to maybe do something in – art history, photography, and something sociology, gender and media kind of stuff. Okay. Like some kind of, you know, because that's kind of been an observational expertise that I've been involved with right. for the last you, you 400 have, years of my life. Yeah, I was going to say you, you have know, a bit of experience for that, sure, yeah. Yeah, looking what it means to be like an outsider in mainstream and, and, and not just in music, but also like I became a um, – a front end developer or like a website developer in the computer science through the nineties and two thousands. So I felt that way in that profession as well. Blah, 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 blah. I took some photography classes because I felt I needed to understand the medium better and fell in love with it again. So I'm like hot right now in, in COVID actually thinking about what F stops are and shutter right. speeds <laughs> and processing and, it's so cute because I'm in these class. I'm in these classes, and it's great because we went online. Like everything went online, so it's it's been a great experience. I'm still in the middle of it, and just because I got to talk about it, I am a solid high C student. Like I, low B is my comfort zone. I can kill it at a low B, and this last semester, full time, straight A's. That's awesome. Well, congratulations. That, that, that's out of, well, yeah. absolutely worth celebrating. That's wonderful. <laughs> so, so okay. So then you said something very important, I think, with, uh, with, with your start in photography that it wasn't necessarily something where you're like, I'm going to be this photographer and, and, and take photos. It was, it was almost a social lubricant <laughs> slash shield in some ways to be like, Hey, I, you know, I got this thing. If I don't know what, if I don't know anybody at this show or don't know what to do with myself, or whatever, Hey, it's cool. I'm like taking these pictures and Hey, did you guys know that? Remember that crazy thing that happened? Like here's, I've got pictures here. Uh, right. so, so did you feel that that was something that kind of gave you that shorthand to uh, build familiarity and make yourself more at ease with folks maybe you did, didn't know so well. Um, you know, and I'm not even talking about just bands because I think you brought up an important point that some of the most interesting pictures from historical uh, music epochs, if you will, isn't necessarily even the bands. It's like, it's the crowd. It's like, oh, here are these kids. Like, you know, they're just this snapshot out of time hanging out in an alley or like, you know, Owl's Bar right. or whatever. And I think that that's so fascinating because gen generally tends to not be what people are focused on <laughs> when you're at a rock show, right? <laughs> right, right, right. But still at the, at the end of the day, if it was something that I wanted to go forward and publish, which I'm not interested in doing that, um, there are great books by people from that era. I mean, the Ed Culver, Blight at the End of the Tunnel, Chris Stein just released a book last year who was in Blondie, right. documenting the New York scene. And so many people have come out just doing this. There's no, absolutely no, like, shortage of people who were excellent observers at these times. Absolutely. And it's, and it's not like... 
you know, I think there's very few people that will uh, launch into something like that. It's like, I'm going to be the documentarian of my times. It's, it's, it's more just like, oh, this is a cool thing to do. Well, it's interesting that you say that because I'm going to take it from another angle. Okay. I think that people, so one of my favorite photographers, Michael Greco, mm -hmm. is actually coming out. Like, I didn't even know this. He showed me his book that he actually photographed punk rock shows in Boston. So I think that they, from the time of the late 70s, photojournalism and the idea of documenting was there. And there was media that wanted those photographs. And I think more so than anywhere when we talk about like Los Angeles and the 1970s, 80s skate scene, mm -hmm. or, which was very documented, there were skate scenes all over the world. But we in Los Angeles were the ones that there was a skate, an amazing skate scene in your city. Yeah. But we were the ones that knew how to show up with a camera crew and a camera. And so we had the photographs. So it looks like we were ground in. <laughs> right. You yeah. know? It's almost so, the uh, win winner's history of... Uh, yeah, winners of are who... Yeah, you, you exactly. got It's got to be documented or it's not a thing. <laughs> exactly. Like, you can't just talk about that scene because it's really the start of visual media where we're mm -hmm. looking at stuff that's moving that we can identify and relate to it's not an old-timey black and white movie it's now video footage that that means something that places us as humans into the scene so what would you say makes when, when you are talking about composition and uh and taking a picture for a punk rock show or just you know rock show or whatever what, what do you think makes a good shot for me Okay, there's a lot that make a good shot that I like to look at. But for me, I like to find the moments before the stage dive. I love to look at artists on stage in contemplation. Um, and that absolutely reflects in my live shots. It's that moment that the guitarist snuck away to just sit down for a second, like in the midst of what was a real high energy chaos, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like candid, mo actually, God, the moment before the stage dive would be an incredible title. That's the <laughs> Oh, let's write that down. <laughs> That's pretty good, I gotta say. <laughs> uh, and so then, because there's always the, and there are moments too that perhaps they don't seem important or noteworthy at the time, but you can find later meaning in them also. Uh, like, you know, like people that, Oh, this was just like some kid in the scene, like hanging out the show, and like, oh, they turned out, you know, they were in this band, and they did did this other thing, and then, and it's it's interesting to me how, like, what you know, every photo is a story, right? But the 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 story can change in context with the times, and I think it's one of the reasons why it's so important for that kind of thing to be documented, frankly. And it's it's, I've always been fascinated by it. I, I'm not much of a photographer myself like I, I can compose a shot but there's so many other people that are so much more talented that i i'm, I'm really fascinated by the process and, and maybe there are podcasts that do that i'm not saying that's what this podcast is but i think it's really compelling and i think it's very okay. interesting because there is a thought process behind it and you can see the artistry in it like you know to see a shot from someone like a charles peterson or something along those lines like you know they have okay. They they know the the feel of what's happening, maybe what's about to happen, and like as you mentioned, they can do like you know the moment before the stage dive, or something along those lines, and it makes us for such a cool, unique thing. Right, but Charles Peterson's specialty was being able to create the energy by using. I mean, his stuff looks energized if an artist is just standing still because he's right. using light and momentum and the chaos. He uses he actually captures what an audience feels like they're seeing, which is a lot of motion and intensity. And that, that's, that's why he thing, is yeah. excellent at what he does, you know, what he did and what he does. And, and that was one of the early like L7 bucket list things for me as part of L7 was to be photographed by him. Oh yeah. L7. He, we should talk about that band. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Ab absolutely. Uh, well, and that's something. And so, you know, speaking, kind of doing a pivot, I guess, uh, over to L7. One thing I always thought was really cool as just a visual aesthetic 
when you guys had like the sort of um, the unified rocking, and and for, for those for those listening, I'm doing like the the this move where like there's the guitar going. And uh, you know, I usually it usually looked like it was like you and Danita that were rocking at the same time, like all and those, Susie and Susie too. But since you guys were and usually, uh, since you guys were on the same side of the stage, like you get this kind of, I mean, I I don't mean that it, it sounded like Kiss, but like in a way that Kiss was fun. That right. it's like oh, not only is this aggressive. You know, like you know, mean, powerful music, but this is a fun show, and it's right. it's something that I, I guess I have a lot of disdain for people that don't like fun in like loud, weird, heavy music because I'm a big proponent of fun. I guess that, that that's what I'm trying to say, but it's it always seemed like something very, very natural and an outgrowth of the music. But how much were you guys thinking about stage presentation because? You were in a weird spot that, like, most, you know, there, there, there was uh, metal bands, uh, there were punk rock bands, but it wasn't like how it is now, where it's, I think it's a lot easier to find an audience. And L7 was, you know, uh, it, to me, it seemed like a very interesting ba- hard rock band that come, came from a punk rock world. And it didn't seem like there was a lot of, it was a path you it seemed like mostly had, you had to forge yourself. So when that came together... And, you know, was it was this a natural outgrowth of playing the tunes? Uh, did you think m- very much about the stage presentation? Like what? You know, there weren't like there weren't meetings, if that's what you're <laughs> talking about. Like, we didn't meet with a choreographer. Um, <clears throat> you know, f- uniquely, we I grew up in a time where media was limited So I never had exposure to, say, Kiss or anybody who might have kind of started, even Hawkwind. I had no visual media. I didn't. It was only audio. So um, the only way I would see other artists performing were to go to shows or if there was like Don Krishna Rock, like some kind of Sunday night kind of thing or PBS. The midnight special. Yeah, I mean, one of my (laughs) earliest... Like mo- like moments of clarity in my life was glued to like I think it was a black and white television set watching The Clash do a live performance, nice. and part of what um, one of the members did was through like talked about how the barricade was BS. They'd never played in front of a barricade, and then threw himself over the barricade and rolled into the audience. And I was seven or six when I saw that, right. and that to me was, you know, as you know, that's what I want. I, like there was just no question that it was a combination of music and performance presentation and very natural and very organic and the it, music spoke and the body spoke. So L7 came out of a time where you just kept touring. Touring was how you showed local promoters that you weren't just a local band who should be paid beer and open, that you played Arizona, New Mexico. It didn't matter if nobody was at that show. You went and did it and you showed that you were on a level of a a touring act, Right. right? And then that's how you moved up. So we played a lot. We played a lot. We worked day jobs and rented vans and borrowed equipment and borrowed vans and, you know, called record stores and asked them what the, lit, the, you know, the club in their town was, what the flyers were on the wall, you know, what's the club called, called those clubs and booked shows and would play every weekend and then every day until we could. And the, the physical part of it just kind of sometimes comes out to make each other laugh. Like we were just trying to make each other laugh. Well, and that's, it seems, you know, and it's, I would say, hopefully, say it's the case with most bands. But the idea that you have this almost in the trenches mentality that you're, you have to rely on each other, and part of that, you know, means mm-hmm. keeping each other in good spirits, being in absurd situations that you wouldn't necessarily be if you were just like an, a regular human being going about your day. Uh, but having this like unique and shared experience together, and mm-hmm. you know, the, the, it's, it's in the word band, <laughs> right? You're, you're banding together for a common. <laughs> and topic. it's in the word and 
<laughs> yes, true. Oh, that's good. I like that. That's that's solid. <laughs> make a note. Make a note. <laughs> take 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 a note. Uh, so, I, and I, and I guess we're getting a little ahead of ourselves with things because I did I did want to mention that I mean it, before you got D, uh, y- you know you you hooked up with Susie and Danita, and. It's, it seemed like, obviously, D is, when, you, when you start playing with D, that that's when things really click. That's when you're like, hey, this is, this, this is where we want to be going. I mean, was that, that, was that like an instantaneous, yes, this is the correct thing situation? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were other members of the band prior to D, but there was a desire to feel like we were all on the same page, that we were a gang or a tribe, however you want to say it. And D really brought that. And we, you know, we were friends with D prior. She played in other bands. We were all from the same scene. We knew each other and yeah. yeah. And and she, hell of a drummer too. And that yeah. also that that's also nice when you're a rock band. You can't really Absolutely. You don't want a tippy tapper. <laughs> have you seen or are you aware of the documentary Pretend We're Dead, which is the L seven documentary? I am, yes. I, I quite enjoyed it. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I encourage anyone who's a fan of, definitely of L7, but generally a fan of that era and that energy to check it out. The The filmmakers did a great job of capturing what it was like. I liked a lot that you had, uh, I think it was a height camera uh, that, that, that you got, right? Is, am I off base? Yeah, the band always, said, like I said... We know how to document ourselves here in Los Angeles, California. Right, yeah. And, and it, was, it was so awesome, uh, and, and, and it's been a little while since I've seen it, but it's, it was so awesome to be because it, it almost prefaced the like, sort of Instagram world, right? Like, where, like, now that's commonplace. Everyone can, like, sh- you know, got a device that can, like, shoot a high-def movie in their pockets. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was far less... It was far less uh, common at the time, and I think it was you know, the, the, and there's like nice little moments. Uh, there's the thing where you know you're at the uh, the thing the thing in DC, um, the Rock for Choice thing, mm-hmm. backstage with Ian from Fugazi, and like I think someone calls them like the Alan Alda of punk rock. Yeah, and he says yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're Carol Burnett of punk rock. It's like, <laughs> that's amazing. That's so great. Uh, those are just unique and cool and like, unguarded moments. And mm-hmm. did did you ever did was that just done in the spirit of like, hey, let's just try this and you know see what happens? Uh, or what, did, was there ever like an end goal with any of that footage in mind or or anything? Or was it just doing it for the hell of it? Yeah, that's the interesting thing is that my personally, I usually never have end goals in anything, and that's why I have an entire like storage locker full of negatives and fires and diaries because I never have an end goal. And actually, you know, my, uh, I'm a musician who loves the performance process and doesn't really love the recording process, you know? So it's not that I don't, I just don't love it the way other musicians love it as a form of expression. To me, like recording is almost sort of this gut wrenching need to have to put something out to tour, to go play riot fest in 2020. 21 right. with an amazing lineup. Yeah. And so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, I know that people probably judge me on what era I stopped listening to music because we all have <laughs> that era. My era was really deeply rooted in like 2006. Like some of my favorite bands are My Chemical Romance and Thrice and oh, okay. Taking okay. Back Sunday. Like okay, I gotcha. actually. Like, I'm 100% kind of like my last era was the MySpace era of music. That is kind of the MySpace era, isn't it? I didn't even think about that, but that's... <laughs> yes, who's thinking sort of, of MySpace like was... these days? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and that's something that I wanted to bring up because you've... You recorded... Uh, I, one of the things I like doing, and I didn't realize it was the thing I... I did so much in this show until Mike Moraski pointed it out as sort of kind of go through the records chronologically because it helps tell the story of the music. Uh, Smell the Magic, that was uh, Jack and Dino uh, that you recorded that with, right? Partially. What Can you tell me... So, so that's... Tell me where you were at as a player and as a band. And I, I think it's it's interesting, too, when people that have made iconic records, like some of the records that you've made 
kind of express reticence or uh, lack of excitement, maybe, for recording music. I, I, I mean, as a necessary evil, is it just, did you look at it as like a delivery system? Like, what's the Minutemen saying? Like, you know, there's, there's like, the record is the flyer to get you to the show. Is that, like, more like how you look at it? They said that? Yeah. That was I should Mike, really know my own history. That, that was a Mike Wattism, and I thought that was so, like, well, first of all, that's so Minutemen, right? It's like, a, there's, there's gigs and flyers, and, like, the record is a flyer. Right. I love that. Uh, but, yeah, t- t- for, for your own edification, um, that's, I, I think that's actually in that documentary that they did. I can't, or some yeah. interview or something. Mike Watt right. talks a lot. He might have said it to me. I don't remember, but. Exactly. I think that the case with L7 was a little bit like that. Um, you know, we showed up with three songwriters and the really great thing is not some like, I mean, I, these iconic records are great, but watching each of those songwriters grow over the years has been incredible to me, like at the, the craft of expression and being able to tell a story and being, you know, melody, the melody that has come out of it and rhythm and the musicality that's come out of all of the writers. Yeah. And it's interesting. You know, D- Danita went on to do, um, her project, the stellar moment the stellar moments. Yeah. And, um, Susie has done a couple little things here and there. And then I went on to do some bands as well. And it's just great to, be able to listen to everyone's stuff and see where they went. And uh, coming out from the perspective of a listener or a fan, you may not immediately be able to divine each person's like voice, if you will, so, like, songwriting voice within it. You just kind of think of it as, as this sure. greater whole. But uh, you know, something I, I did enjoy about that documentary, which again, it's been a while, but it, it, I think it did kind of show just how important everybody's contributions uh, to, to that band was and how it was. You, you brought the clash uh, earlier that, that you saw a clash in black and white. There was a great quote about them where it's something like, Oh, that was, that was a band of uh, four front people. And I was like, mm. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And I like that because that kind of told you the story of like, okay, you got, everyone's like a forceful personality and they're just, you know, bringing it hard. And it's something where with L7, I think, the dynamic interplay between all four of you is something that created something very exciting. And it doesn't sound dated. That's the other thing. Is that like, you know, sir, you could say, oh, it's this production detail is a, you know, it's a little bit dated, you know, but it, the music itself still sounds fresh. It still works. It still pops. And it's because I think that there was always a focus on song driven, hard rock, yeah. that there was still a sense of, singing along of, of melody. It's like that influence of the Ramones, perhaps you could say of that era that you could really, you felt the intensity of it, but you also could connect with the, the, the vocal storyteller and the lead style. Absolutely. You know, both Susie and Danita's lead styles are very melodic and, and, and I mean, I mean, it's the word story driven, but if that makes sense, I'm, no, 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 it does, and it's it's there. There's a musicality to them, and I say that because <laughs> there's certainly like the, you know, the Ingve Malmsteen kind of like technical precision, but it's like okay, cool, but we're that's not a song. That's wankery. That's like you know, that's right. That's, that's fine, but I would rather right. hear something less acrobatic in its nature that serves the song and and like makes something. And, and you also brought the Ramones, and that's something where I always found L7 a difficult band to describe, but I I would mention the Ramones and one of the reasons why is because it's like no it's forceful but it's catchy as hell mm-hmm. but there, there's there's a driving nature to this music but there's songs there like there's songs that like you could play these songs in a more stripped down environment and it, it, it would work they're not gonna but it would mm-hmm. work and that's something where it seems like to a certain degree that never goes out of style but it also kind of seems like people get hyper focused on oh they're a metal band or they're uh you know they're this band or oh hey everybody it's jack white and rock is back now it's like, well rock didn't really leave okay but and, and i guess where i'm going with this when is, they but when they say rock is back now what they're saying is they can make over a certain amount of profit <laughs> right exactly in that that's what they mean by it's back rock is back as a profit maker. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I think it's, it's for me, I, I look at bands like L7 as if 
um, you know, you, you, you're pioneering it in a multiple fashions. And one of which that I feel like you don't get credit for is genre-wise, that it was hard rock without being metal, that it was, you know, there are elements of kind of like noise rock and stuff to it, but it was, it, it came from a very unique place that came from your influences. And I think you had a strong Look, look, it, it just, it, it came from a diverse voice and diverse voices are not celebrated. That's... That's all it is. Like people need everything stripped down and very simple to digest, easy to digest food. We did not provide that. Well, you did, and that's fine. You, you because just said what I was trying to say in about like we provided one tenth excellence. of the uh, one tenth of the uh, word. So I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> as as does the audience, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, so. Okay, all right. So, as I say in the documentary, being ahead of your time often means being behind on the rent. <laughs> so true. So, <laughs> wh- where, when did it, things change from balancing that side of things? Um, you know, day jobs, staying one hit, one step ahead of the spider uh, in, in life, towards doing the band more as like a full time operation and being out in the world and being L seven. As the thing, because I think people have this idea, oh, it's all, you know, tour buses and like, oh, if I see them on this cover of this magazine, like, I think it's even like some, some, in, in the documentary, it says something about that, right? It's like people think that you're, they see you on the cover of a magazine that you're a millionaire. And it's like, that's absolutely not the case. That's, that's not true at all. <laughs> uh, so when did things change as far as like becoming a full-time band, I guess is, is, is the question and, and not having to like necessarily worry so much uh, on day-to-day activities. Did that well, change? First off, I don't worry about day-to-day activities. That's a little bit below how I feel about life. I sort of invite everything in and I just make it work and hope for the best. I personally had was only able to not have what we're calling a day job from probably 91 and then I had to get a job in 96. So those were the years that it was more of a full-time thing. I also, though, did not have a home at that time. I was not paying rent at that time. Um, I did not have a car. I didn't have stuffy, stuffy things. So th- that's my story. So yeah, <laughs> you were, I, did no, that's a, I think that's important because you you made it work, yeah. but you made it work by basically not having what people right what, the right. trappings so of I, a normal life. Right. I got a paying job on on Lollapalooza. We did Lollapalooza in 96, 95, (laughs) 94. One of those. In 1994. So I, that was the first time where I was like, wow, I really want to get an apartment. I got an apartment in San Francisco and then I really couldn't afford my apartment. And that was back when San Francisco was affordable. Yeah, that's so much. It's so much worse now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my landlord was Billy from Faith No More, so it was uh, he send he, you know, was a very generous landlord, and I still <laughs> couldn't afford it. Friend of the show, former guest, uh, and also just professional good dude, as well as a great player. Yes, absolutely. So that and that law was a. I mean, and that was a big. I mean, that was a big show. There was, uh, you know, that was the one with Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds was on that one, right? And, um, <laughs> there, but that's also kind of, you know, somebody somebody described it as like the open salad bar of uh, of rock music, uh, <laughs> which I thought was a very funny description. Did you find that those were, was a good experience? I mean, you're, you're, you're playing. Yes, the salad bar was great. <laughs> Delicious. The garbanzos were to die for. Mm-hmm. Uh, Absolutely. But did you did you find that was a, like a good experience overall uh, with the you know getting over with you know people that are you know, maybe in seated environments or something along those lines you're rocking to them like in the, in the middle of the afternoon it seems like it's a, it could be frustrating but also it's an opportunity right so did did you find that what you were doing went over with new folks that came in or did you find it was sort of like, ah, you know, we got to play with some bands we liked and saw some bands that were really nice folks. I think that there's a lot of like 2020 kind of observations and they're multi-layered that could go back with that particular tour, that particular year, 
and what was going on with that year. It's very, very nuanced <laughs> with the, the death of Kurt Cobain, right. with um, how, you know, moving forward, we were going to see more festivals um, based on that model. And then just some really dumb insider industry stuff that was going on at that time with how concerts were going to be presented and who was going to come and take over that era, you know, of concert promotion all the way down to the personal aspect of being in a band um, at that time. So it's, it would be hard to make a single statement about it. But I think you're on to something. I'm excited to read your um, essay on it. <laughs> I think you're more knowledgeable than I am. And my, you know, I come from Standpoint, you know, so yeah. Standpoint is one of the most, you know, excellent ways to look at history, yet at the same time, it doesn't really, it's only from a single viewpoint. Well, the, and there's always that parallax view or uh, uh, the Rashomon effect, right? <laughs> right. The, the, the observational nature of events can change from person to person in their own uh, lived experience. Absolutely. And uh, I definitely fall into that category because there's a part of me that remembers being a depressed baby the whole time on that tour, like just really not able to like manage my expectations and manage my emotions. But then there's also like I look back and I can see the great experience. And I, as an artist, sometimes avoid educating myself on what people say about back then. I kind of don't listen to your radio show, although I have listened to a couple, honestly, but because I don't want to be fed a false narrative about my own viewpoint and my own history. Gotcha. So it's, it's, it's challenging. Like I haven't watched the document, you know, all the documentaries really from that time. And it's only now that I'm sitting down and really reading some of the stuff about the eighties hardcore scene in Los Angeles. Because now I almost feel a little bit ready to like let that stuff go and then go out and talk about it. Because I really want to do, I, and I don't know if this is any interest to your viewers, the next project I'm really working on right now um, is called 14 and Shooting. And it's going to be a fanzine style subscription of six issues mm. of my mm -hmm. work. But what I'm going to do, because I love collaboration, I want to have another photographer or person from that era come in and talk about what they looked for when they went to shoot. So I did started interviewing Ed Culver and that's going to be the first issue. So I'm going to talk to Ed Culver about his vantage point, publish some of his photographs of same shows that we both were at and talk about the difference and what was going on. Very brief. And then just have him pick like 10 of my photographs from that era and then I'll talk about them a little bit. So it's going to be a subscription. Nice. That sounds great. I'm, gonna, I'm not prepared totally to announce it now, but if anybody is interested, I run a newsletter off of my website, jenniferfinch.com. It's very personal. It's not like, and now this is coming up. It's just to kind of create a community to keep everybody a little bit informed. Like I feature other artists or people that are in our community and uh, on this so that's probably where i'm going to announce it it's going to be a limited edition i'm only going to sell 99 slots of it and it'll be through the mail so that's i know that's I, a lot no that's great that, that, i can't do anything easy no, that, that, that's, that's, I, I appreciate the sense of scope and scale so so that's something <laughs> that uh, whether people are you know whether it's not like launched yet but if you wanted to Sign up uh, if you go to jenniferfinch.com. They they could sign right, up. Right, right. Okay. And I love this idea that I'm gonna I'm gonna just have it's only gonna go out to 99 people. It's all gonna be signed and editioned. It's gonna be done kind of like the Sub Pop Singles Club, I suppose, like sure. as a model, yeah. right? And but in it because it's gonna be serialized, the people who are receiving it can help give feedback for the next. So it's not like I don't like this idea of a book because a book is so. Static. It's a passive or a media. documentary, right. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, literally, my brain is from 2006, <laughs> my space era, where things are just a little bit more fluid and flexible and not so rigid. There's involvement. You can... Uh, <laughs> there, there's a back and forth to it. Where I'm getting with that is I think the idea of this... Uh, you know, sub pop singles club style thing. That's fantastic. And, and, and I can't think of anything that does that off the top of my head. Maybe there is something, but I'm that, that sounds really interesting. And I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in seeing how that, that plays out. 
Uh, so what, was that just something where that engagement is something that you're bringing in as part of the process because you want that engagement as part of the process? Like what's the, what's the mindset behind doing it in this much more difficult way? <laughs> That's potentially you know, rewarding. It's not. It's an easier way for me. Okay, I mean, gotcha. creating a fanzine is. It feels much. You know. Well, we yeah. come from the zine world, so yeah. Of course, right. It, 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 so right. Natural. Yeah. Right now, I'm uh, okay. So I have a mentor right now. Her name is Elizabeth Waterman. She's working on a series called Dark Angels. It's amazing. She has gone to strip clubs all over the country and has kind of done the same thing that I did with punk rock shows, but in this other world. And um, uh, she's in, incredible with composition and light and storytelling and all of this stuff. And she literally, like, her deal is she does, does these really beautifully done you know, 30 image self-published albums or with publishers, like, like every year she does something with like to, to extend this body of work. And it's something that she's worked on for like five years. And I, I just see her suffering over this and such. And that's her experience. Like this intensity over these. And I'm just not that person. I'm not that person that wants to suffer over what I produce. So I think that this is a way that I don't have to. Interesting. So in a way, it actually is easier. And check her know. out. Like, check her that out. That sounds like, amazing. Her, yeah, I'm Her stuff is great. That's, that, yeah, that sounds I'm wonderful. I'm proud to say I work with her. And I met her by a fluke by this whole Zoom you know, new socializing. Are you right. using, are you using the socialization? I have. My new favorite thing to do. And I mean, I'm on it every day. I'm in groups of people. We do like artist groups and just friend groups and family groups and all this kind of stuff. And my new favorite thing to do is now knowing if somebody has like Alexa in their home, if you're <laughs> doing FaceTime, I could say, Alexa, play cannibal corpse, come blood. <laughs> and their Alexa turns on. So it's like Zoom pranks. Yes, try was, it was, would be the yes. Try the it category for this. That's amazing. I would, yes, <laughs> or FaceTime, whatever your yeah, whatever your your modus operandi. Uh, yeah, for, for connection. Yeah, speaker speakers work the best. So, can we also can we talk about the? L7 reunion. That, that was like what, 2015, 2014, yep. somewhere around those lines, right? Yes. So we talked about the doc. Right. Pretend we're dead. Yep. We talked about the new record. We scattered well, we, the rats. We, we oh, briefly no, we, 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 we mentioned it, and, and we should tour. we should talk about that. So I was going to pivot to that from talking about uh, the reunion shows. Yes. But we can talk we can talk about it any order you want. It's yes. You're you're the guest. You're giving of your time for this. So uh, did you want to talk about the record first? <laughs> the record sure. i listened I, I was listening to it yesterday i was i was yes I, and i actually would honestly have, honestly it's one of my favorites i would have gone to see you play i believe it was with le butcherettes if i remember correctly in chicago but i live in milwaukee now chicago is an hour and 45 minutes one direction an hour and 45 minutes back and for whatever reason i had to like something something to do early that's in the a morning that's a I very interesting say. story thank you for sharing that <laughs> Well, because Milwaukee doesn't rate for like larger tours usually. Is what well, it's we did. We we've, we've played Eagles twice. Yeah, and I was on tour both times. But okay, I'm just saying. I know. I I'm I <clears throat> Eagles. I think was just canceled on this tour. And what a great venue you have. Have you talked about that venue? Eagle the Eagles. Is yeah. That, um, it's an interesting it's history. Yeah. The uh. It, there's there's a lot there's definitely a lot to that place. It's got it's got it's got a lot of history. I think Dylan played there, right? I mean, it's crazy when you're old enough and you've lived on this world long enough that you have toured at certain venues and then you actually have the honor and privilege to go back to these venues right. only to be told that they are somehow haunted. <laughs> and you can just think like all of those haunting stories of you know of ye old Victorian times of murder and then. All of a sudden, it's like, oh no, this person was killed at CBGB's on this bear, and you're just like, oh, they're haunting. Well, and there's that weird pool in the that one green room, like, um, like it's a it's a crazy setup. Like it's unlike 
It's a very it's unique venue. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. it's also interesting because I'm from Oakland, but California, but... That's uh, not interesting. Well, this... <laughs> Oh, teasing. Uh, Look, hyphy is one of my favorite music movements because I'm from the 2000s, and that was from Oakland. It, it is. From you guys 2000s. had your it moment. Is, it is from Oakland, uh, but I moved to Milwaukee to live two years ago. But I had always come here on tour, so th- to go to these places that I had played with, that I had played mm-hmm. in, and see them from the perspective of a touring band, and to to see them uh, locally, and kind of like find out more about them, and find out more of the history beyond just you know loading in, mm-hmm. loading out also playing the show in between. Uh, pretty fascinating. The long involved story behind all of that is that I was really sad to not have seen you play recently, which w- the one I, w- I would have had to go to would have been Chicago uh, because I also really enjoy Le Butcherettes as well. And I think they're a hell of a band, yeah, but, they're it's, great. but it's a great record. And it's something where I think all, the people that already know L7 and, you know, have, have the other records got into it, but I think it kind of, Fell under some people's radar. And I think that's a shame. It's, it's, have you um, have you checked out uh, Danita Sparks's High Low show, her variety show? I, I saw. I did see. I did see an episode of it, and I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was an excellent. Yeah, use it's of the great. Game. Yeah, yeah, it's great. So, can you talk to me about uh, the recording that that recent record? Like, just coming back and uh, playing with Danita and uh, Susie and D and playing these shows, and then. Is there like just this natural conversation of like, hey, we should, we should have some new songs. We should try to make a record. Like, how does it, how does that come to pass? Is it something you're doing for for yourselves? Is it something where you're like, well, got to put out another flyer? <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's what it was. And you know, it started with this whole thing with the Kickstarter and fans supported that all went sideways, and we can't really talk about it that much. But hmm. then, um, you know, Joan Jett came up with, um, you know, having us go on to Blackheart. So that was, uh, you know, Hail Mary at the last minute. And, yeah, it's a great record. It really is one of my favorites. I always say that most of my favorite L7 records are the ones that I haven't played on. Because for some (laughs) reason I can just enjoy them more. Like there is this song that they do called Moonshine. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, it was kind of, I played on the record, but then they brought another, it's like I, I uh, left the band, right? Sort of, uh, there was a thing going on and You're I left about the, the band right process, at the end. Right. Uh, right. And then I just love these. <laughs> so there's one um, called Little One that I just love these L7 songs that were after me. So, um, yeah. So are don't you, not stick to that. so do you find that it's easier for you to hear those as music because of, you're not thinking of like your involvement with them and like maybe like, uh... yeah, for what, you know what, for every reason I grew up as the little kid that was just way too spirited and way too sensible, sensitive and never was given the tools on like how to just come forward and know what I want. Instead, I'm just like, Oh, my socks hurt. I have to be barefoot. You know I mean? I'm just like way overly. <laughs> <clears throat> so I don't always, I mean, literally, I will have not heard something I have played on in years, and it could almost sneak into a bar, and I'll be like, oh, that sounds awesome. That's really, oh, the bass is kind of good. And people go like, dumbass. That's you. (laughs) Yes. And then I'll be like, wow, I'm not, you know, I'm so, uh, you know, it's just whatever, whatever you want to call it, just disconnect or trauma. I just own it. It's just who I am. Thank God, you know, that Danita and Susie and Dee don't feel that way, or maybe they do. I don't know. But, you know, right. I think that it's, it creates like a, it makes the a greater power, whole. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and, and it's, it would be the additive recipe would be different without the parties involved, uh, bringing what they bring to it. Right. As we, as right. we touched upon earlier. So talk to me about this, this, um, this most recent record, like what was, it's been a while since you'd recorded with them. I mean, uh, what is beauty process was, uh, was it, was it 15 years? Like you had, a, we've had a couple bands since then. Was it longer than that? Let's see. I don't even know. Um, <laughs> but it's been, this, this is why I shouldn't be doing the interviews. Cause I'm just going to tell you, mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, that's fine. You don't need to know. I'm, I'm the, I'm the one that should have that information up because, uh, yeah, I don't. And but the the point the point of the question is, it had been a long time since you'd recorded, uh, but you had been playing together 
So you're you're back with to playing L7. Beer, with L seven. Yes. And you, yes. you, you, you and, have that. And, and, right. And quite honestly, in my bands that came after L seven, which is other star people, yep. who we came out we did a record on A and M records in nineteen ninety nine with Roy Thomas Baker, who is the producer of Queen and Freaking Aerosmith. Queen. Yeah, man. Right. So again, it's another like nod to bizarre rock past you know, mixed with kind of lo-fi audio, which I think people completely did not get in 99. Like it was, but it is a great record if anybody ever wants to check it out. A&M fell apart right when the record was released and we went over to Interscope and I think they kind of, one, they didn't know what to do and two, they already had no doubt. So they already had a female voice on their label. So honestly, and, and, and I've been told that by Jimmy Ivey since then, like he was just like, it was really hard for us. We didn't know what to do, but out of that, the licensing from those songs did great. Like, I don't know, like, um, do you know a movie called office space? I, I was just going to say, I believe one of them was an office space, which is yeah, actually which, one of my, it's in my top 20 movies of all time. So yes, I it's in a lot of people's top 20. I haven't seen it. <laughs> so, <laughs> So there you go. But we really did get to be a part of like that, like I said, that kind of early 2000s cultural movement. We were on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Roswell. And, you know, we we did a lot of really good work for what we were the kind of what we were given in the short amount of time that we had. And I love the people in that band. And working with Roy Thomas Baker was a trip and a half. Yeah, was that what was that fellow like? What was his? He is exactly what you would think of somebody from that era, like right. kind of on the spectrum and <laughs> bizarre as shit, and overly sensitive and inappro- sexually inappropriate. <laughs> I mean, all of it, flamboyant, right? And with an, an ear, a, a, a natural ear. So we. Um, you know, I'm sitting there with one of my writing partners at that time, and he, we were really talking about the guitar sounds of the cars and that, yeah. that biting, biting, driving guitar sound. And f- from working in the 90s, it came full with production was really about, like, the microphone and the type of drum and the drum tunnel and, like, Steve Albini big room sounds and, and all of these amazing producers through the 90s that L7 has got, had got to work with. So it was really about that perfect P bass and, like, that perfect orange head or whatever. Right, right. And, um, you know, so we're sitting there and, you know, my, my partner, who's Zakara, said, you know, Roy – how do we get that really chunky? And he's sitting there with his guitar playing the riff. Mm-hmm. And Roy just goes, oh, darling, that's not the equipment. That's the player. Oh! <laughs> and, and we were just like, oh, God. Oh. Thomas up. Baker. Oh, my God. This is going to suck. Roy Thomas and Baker, like first of year. all, how dare you? Secondly. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, he was, he was that producer that believed in ego down. He isolated you. He took us to a studio in the middle of nowhere. He broke everybody's ego apart till we were just puppets. Dang. That's a. Just that. Sometimes I call up Xander and I'll just be like, remember that time that we were like, I still have such traumatic memories. Yeah. So. We were in this, it was this desert environment called Lake Havasu with no building development, except that Roy Thomas Baker had this house on a hill that looked like a spaceship landed and around (laughs) it was just dry (laughs) desert. And there was this place we could walk up like just above like a little meditation, desert meditation place that was like a couple rocks and maybe like a big boulder someone had dragged. And Xander and I were sitting there and we were like, we're losing control of this record A&M, you know, I I loved everybody there at the time. They're amazing people, but they were losing control of the budget. They were losing control of the record, and it really was because we were dealing with Roy Thomas Baker, who was a big baby, basically. And so we (laughs) elected Xander. We elected Xander to put some boundaries around him that he had to start showing up. Like, we, if we were going to say we were starting at 11, we really needed to start at 11. Because one of his things was to get everyone to start at 11, and then he would be late. 
uh, right? Like and we couldn't, thing. we weren't allowed. Yeah, it was yeah. such, it was just like this really gross millionaire mind, Trump pansy style power move, bringing it up to the future, the, the current. Um, <laughs> Did you say Trump pansy, by the way? Because I, Trump pansy. I, I nearly sitting, started my coffee when you said that. So that's, that's, <laughs> I, I, that's a new we're one. So we're sitting on this hill and I'm looking down at this spaceship. And Xander walking down this path alone, dressed like we were completely ridiculously dressed in like new road, new wave gear back then. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was wearing a suit, walking down this path, and he's standing in front of the spaceship. And he went, because I could see Roy, the dust of Roy's, what's that? Rolls Royce. He drove a Rolls Royce. So, you know what? Anytime, it, okay, Rolls Royce. He, it's the dust around the Rolls Royce because you can see it from miles away driving down the dirt road, right? And he's <laughs> like pig pen leaving like a. Yes, <laughs> and he it. <laughs> screeches in front of the studio. He sees Xander standing there waiting for him, like outside with his arms crossed. I can't hear what they're saying. Roy gets out of the car. And he, he hunches, he moves his shoulder like this mm-hmm. and he comes up to Xander and he's like, I can see him kind of go, uh, and then Xander like, and a giga, like kicking the dust, like trying to speak. And then Roy moving his shoulders back and getting closer. Cause here's my observation of men communicating with each mm-hmm. other. Right. Mm-hmm. He gets closer and then Xander kind of says a thing. And then all of a sudden Roy just looks at him turns away, gets back in the car, and the cloud of dust goes back down the hill, and he doesn't show up for another eight days. Wow. Wow. I'm like, yep. (laughs) Okay, some of that was exaggerated because it may have been eight hours, but it felt like eight days. Right, right, right. (laughs) Hours, it seemed like it. The the important thing is a, a grown adult man, professional that was being paid for a service, mm-hmm. decided to throw a fit. Yeah, but it, that it, was we the were. era. That was the era. Like, right, I got coming to Coming up next week, we have, well, we get, I got we have Roy Thomas Baker next like. week coming up. Yeah. Get, get him. He, that's the story. That, he's the story. Well, and that's... Okay, so obviously the, the, the dude's made some great records. You know, if nothing else, just for the Queen records alone and the and the and the stuff that was pioneered. Well, there. let's yeah. not forget Journey. Yeah, I was gonna say, was it four? When the lights <laughs> go down. I mean, we just thought it would be just. I don't know what we were thinking that because we could have gone ahead and just had like we had started touring with White Stripes and we were touring with Weezer and we were touring with these bands and we could have taken the route to go that to, to go that route. And that it's like one of those choices where maybe we shouldn't have made that choice mm. to try to really pick it up that far up the ladder. You know, I don't right. know. Because that, that band was what it was like a it was about a five six year run like a net like ninety seven to two thousand three something something along those lines. Is that, is that yeah? Track? Well, we started writing. We started writing in the you know like in ninety seven like ninety six ninety seven, and we really were just friends that were getting together writing doing demos and having fun with music and then made that decision like oh well we were on a&m and we're all sitting in there with david anderley who's the owner of a&m and um jeff suey who is in our department and debbie southwood smith smith and on the phone with jimmy Iovine and all of these people that were the greats of the music industry in that moment and uh, that was the decision <laughs> so yeah i like to call it my drag queen phase <laughs> I did a lot of drag back then. Yeah? What do you, what do you yeah, well, we played a lot of drag shows. I mean, that yeah. was kind of part of our, our, our thing was that that level of, you know, we wanted that diversity and that was our crowd. Always some of the most welcoming crowds to kind of weird stuff, too. Yeah. I mean, I, Absolutely. As, a, as a baseline. And that's something that I think that is maybe not understood by people coming from a more, you know, baseline caveman response <laughs> to things that they don't understand it's like no they this crowd is going to be very welcoming to you as, as long as you're not a jerk if you're not yeah. a jerk like they're they're gonna they're gonna be are they gonna be your biggest fan not necessarily but they're gonna they're gonna be there for you and they're gonna like, mm-hmm. give you an opportunity and it's it, it's it, it's an untold story and i'm not the one to tell it but i i think it's something that throughout history the uh you know the drag world and the punk rock world has has interceded 
Mm-hmm. Perfect Very example, much so. Perfect example to pivot to Serial Mom I and mean, freaking John Waters. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was such an incredible melding of worlds. Because uh, I saw when I saw that movie, I'm a, I'm a big John Waters fan. And when I saw that movie, it was like, oh, that's L7. But you, have, <laughs> what, you what was the name of the band that you you you, you we performed as a, a band as an alias? Uh, like uh, what was it, Camel Toe or something along those lines? What? 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 what it was. <laughs> it was something like really. Very good. Really that was the, Yes, that was ridiculous. the character. So, who are some of your favorite producers from the nineties? I am a big Steve Albini fan. I always have been. Uh, I think he's great. I. I think. Then let's talk about him for a moment. Okay. I feel he's the only producer that's been on my personal wish list that I've never gotten to work with. I feel like we, L7 has, you know, had the privilege to work with most of the great producers of that era. Yeah, except and Dino, for- Vig, um, I mean, mm-hmm. you, you've got like Garth. a murderer's row. Yeah, Garth, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that is kind of, yeah, that seems like a pretty it's, natural It's fit. crazy. Yeah. It would seem like a natural fit, and I think it would be something to look forward to if that was something that would make sense. You know, and, and, and you know, I, I kind of feel like if it's not going to be L7, it needs to be something I do with him <laughs> at I some mean, point, uh, not to just inject that, but... I'm sure he'd be psyched to do it, and yeah. he's, he's, a, he's a friend of the show, let's put it that way. Yeah, uh, but the, the guy that we'd worked with at Scatter the Rats, Norm Block, was actually a very dear old friend who did come up. I met him in my Other Star People days. We used to do um, Other Star People was a house band for a club called Club Makeup, which was a really big, almost like Studio 54 um, drag queer event in Los Angeles. And um, Norm was the drummer of the band at the time. Not of Other Star People, but he came in and out with that scene. With the... With, with that setup, and so that was. Um, so t- I, I, we originally start. We started talking about making that record, and we, we kind of pivoted away to a couple other things. I'm I'm interested in in Scatter the Rats. I, I want to hear. So you recorded with Norm. Um, that was in L.A. You recorded that mm-hmm. at his studio in Los Angeles, which is basically his home studio that he's set up like traditionally, which kind of came out of the 90s, is that idea of taking over a home to get those really Mm -hmm. organic, those older houses to get those bigger organic sounds, not recreating them in an official studio environment. So it's really attractive to us. Plus, Norm is excellent. He's an excellent songwriter. He's an excellent drummer. He gets great drum sounds, great guitar sounds. So when you're... And I'm spacing on his studio name right now. What does he call his studio? Jack's going to look that up. My Jack, okay. not Jack. And I'm sleeping with Jack and Dino. <laughs> you heard it here first. Uh, the so so the record is a you got the, the multi glasses thing going on. Great. <laughs> I took all this time to do my eye makeup today, and now my glasses are turning into sunglasses. So. So when you're when you're making that record, uh, you know at this point. You know that so that's you recorded it in 2019 or is it 2018? Because it came out in 2019. It was like late 2019, like fall, if I remember right. Yeah, we were recording up until New Year's Eve of 2018. Okay, so you started. Is that right? You started back up with uh, with D and Susie and Danita. Uh, I think I was like 2015, 2014. So you, yes, 2015. How quickly? Like, was it an immediate thing? Like, when you first time you get back in a room together with them, is no, it just, is it just like immediately like snaps back into place that like, oh yeah, or did it take a second? I, it took a it took a second because some of us hadn't played. We're not necessarily like daily sit down at the piano or sit down at the guitar and play. You know, we all have had incredible lives and um i mean i can't speak for the for the the gals i think that we have and um you know it was really about just sitting down and getting used to the gear again and listening and you know seeing what's going on and reconnect and it was interesting because i felt like it just dropped right into where uh you know where i left off but the bet the best parts of it you know so it was it was um I don't know. It made me, I felt great. I know it's, it brings up insecurity definitely. And it brings up like weird fear of, you know, 
I've personally have always had imposter syndrome. Like I'm standing there with a bass and I'm playing and I just, I, someone's, I just feel like, you know, that ego thing, that like thing that just says, they're gonna know. Right. They're gonna right. be like, and you know, then you, you grow up, right? And you're just like, who cares? Like, it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. But, 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 but you, that's always, that voice is. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I came yeah. from, you know, I was raised by my father who was an engineer and there was a lot of this kind of, you know, if you kind of don't get it right, the plane crashes, you know what I mean? Kind of mentality. And uh, thankfully, because I think that it has developed a type of excellence and being able to see excellence in others, you know, and, you know, I feel personally that I'm totally down for people in their process and supporting them through it, which is something that I do professionally. So it, yeah. So to answer your question, you know, it was unspoken whether we were record or not. We were really just trying to get through what was in front of us right. at the time. Yeah, yeah. De- right? de- dealing with the thing most immediately. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> you know, and I think Danita and Susie, of course, as primary songwriters for L7, have a very natural way to write together to reflect um, L7. It's not that natural for me. Like I don't sit down and think I'm going to write an L7 song or, you know, mm-hmm. so yeah. it gets a little yeah. bit, you know, difficult because I'm all over the place in genre. And like, as we know, you need to stay in the brand in order for stuff <laughs> to become yeah. successful because nobody wants to hear, you know, so-and-so do such and such, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you get pigeonholed and that's been a story of my whole life is, you know, trying to sit there, play a, a song about like the death of a relationship with people going like, play shit list. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, like, it's like, okay. I get <laughs> One, it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even sing that song. And two, yes, it's a great song. But <laughs> yeah, here we go. First of all, different singer. Secondly, yeah. you know, fear that I lose you. keeps me with you, you know? And then it's just like, eh, Everglade. Yeah. It's like, uh, oh. Gross. But you know what? That's okay. That's, part of the story so, so did you find that when you you know after you kind of worked through the the initial kind of weirdness of not having played together for so long did you find that you got that almost like you know when you're in a band with someone for a long time you almost get like a sort of a telepathy for like how they play like you can kind of almost foresee what yeah. they're gonna do yeah. next yeah uh when that snapped back was that something where you were you like ah good like okay this 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 feels mo- like we I'm able to concentrate on other things now. Like I'm not thinking about the mechanics of what the what's what's the next part or like what's the what's going to happen next. <laughs> Inter- well, I mean, you're really talking about the inner working of I am yes. yes. What what happens when you walk into? <clears throat> I totally have a lot of faith in mus- muscle memory. You know, I think that the way the brain works is we may not remember certain things on recall, but I think that there's a lot of subconscious memory. And the reality is that set was played. L7 is one of the hardest working bands of that era. We, you know, Fugazi, I would say, is like a band that worked longer and harder. But a lot of the bands that we look at specifically from our, maybe immediately from our community, L7 has out-toured, out-recorded outdone, done the legwork, like more so than a lot of them. The byproduct of that is that although sometimes I may not even remember what the song is called, if you put a bass on me or a guitar, <laughs> right, right. you know, or even I sit behind the drums or at a piano, I like, I'll think I can't play this on piano, but I can sit down and play it because uh, all of a sudden that muscle memory comes back. Yeah, because it, it hits you like whatever in a different part of the brain that's that's not the uh, not the not the part that's going to recite a discography it's, or something, right? <laughs> right. It's the perf- it's the physicality of the performance. Yeah, which should never be underestimated. When I even if people come to me and they say like I want to learn how to play bass or I want to learn how to play guitar, one of the first things that I suggest that people do is put the instrument on and go walk around your house so that Hmm. the things that you do normally, like pour a cup of water or go wash your hands or go to the toilet, have the guitar on so that it becomes a physical extension of you so that, you know, when you go through a doorway, you have to hold it at a certain part to tip it up, you know, and that helps understanding the physicality of 
what you're doing, the extension of the instrument in your space and environment, because then it's whatever, go, you can learn an E to an A to a G to a B, you know, and like know why that works and why it doesn't in theory and why it sounds good to you or not good to you. But really the, that portion of it, when you're on stage, it's no longer music. No, I mean, I guess some people do describe that they do read music as they're going. But literally the point of playing live music for so many of us is that you reboot into a different mode that doesn't have to do with conscious thinking. Right. It's, it's, it's almost like a base. Like the physicality becomes like a, a representation of more, like a different, a different part of the, of the brain and the, and the consciousness that connects differently and, and can, can transcend because of that. Right. It's like the book Inner Game of Tennis that came out in the 70s. I don't know if you've ever... I'm not familiar with that. It's a great book. It's good for anybody, whether you play tennis or not. It's It really is about that your expertise in life, it comes from the hard work, but sometimes you have to put it down and walk away because the subconscious and the brain will continue making you an expert at what you do. Oh, so it's continuing... Outside of holding oh, cool. it. So the subconscious right. is continuing to work in the background, even though right. you're not so actively... It's, yeah, oh. it's, it's written by a tennis coach, but it applies huh. to anything. It applies to anything. So the, sure. this coach would say, like, you know, and it's also that thing when life gets really difficult, when it gets really uncomfortable, and when society gets really uncomfortable, it's because a change is occurring. Right yeah. and and yeah. and hope change and is not, excellence. Is not comfortable. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. and and yes, and hopefully excellence is going to take its place, like some next stage. When it's comfortable is when the backsliding starts. Yeah, and that's where you get regression rather than uh, rather than progress. Yeah. Okay. So, what about Courtney Love? Do you want to know? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what about L Seven and Green Day? Do you want to know? Well, I would like to when when you guys did bricks are heavy with with Butch and uh, well, some Madison and, and Smart. While you were recording the record, is is when Nevermind kind of blew up, right? It, it was like as you were, yeah, like, we were in the, the studio, record, and that is covered in the yeah. It's covered so well in the doc. I love what the filmmakers did with that portion of the doc. It really made me laugh out loud. Well, and it's such an iconic, uh, it's an iconic record for the times. Uh, but yeah, in the documentary, if I remember correctly, it was sort of like there was a feeling like, oh man, like all of our friends are, you know, there's there's this this gold rush that's happening. Everybody's like doing stuff, and uh, here we are. We're we're and we're finishing the record, and it's something where months seem like years, you know, weeks seem like months, like uh, uh, around that time, and. I think the documentary, like, as you said, it did a great job of, of documenting that piece of it because it's something that you don't see that side of it, right? You only see, like, oh, you know, it's a year to the punk broke and here's all these bands doing cool stuff and, like, whatever. But I've never seen that. Is it good? It's good. I, I like it. You know, see it so bad. I've got, I say it's good. I haven't watched it in a very long time, but I remember liking it quite a bit. And I remember, and one of the reasons that I liked it was because there was a lot of extemporaneous non-people playing music things like cameras backstage and much like there was with the L7 stuff because the high eight that, that you were dragging around. Uh, not dragging Well, around. the year that punk broke is Dave Markey, right? Ah, uh, that's, I think so. Dave Markey. I, I believe. I'm going to say Markey. Dave Markey. Dave Markey was actually a filmmaker at that time working in the high yep. eight medium. Yep, right? you got it. So Dave and it's funny because I'm, I actually sat down to really sit down and read oh, the book that they did. We got power. Right. I have a photograph in it. I contributed to the fanzine. We got power back oh, in the day. Nice. So nice. I have a photograph of skater, Tony Alva. Is that my photograph in here? They were kind of, I actually bought this book. So I didn't tag it, but yeah, I have a photo in here. That's, that's wonderful. I, I, I gotta get a copy of that. I've, I've seen, I've seen the book, but I don't, I don't own a copy of it, but yeah, there's a, like, you know, like what they did a really super nice job of like interviewing people and talking about like the scene and it's all the typical players and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They did great. That's the kind of stuff I'd never want to do, but I'm, cause but I'm releasing this fanzine, you know, I'm trying to maybe catch up with what, so I'm not covering the same ground as other people. So, and the, well, the reason I, I brought up recording uh, bricks are heavy with Butch and around that time period is I mean that's that's widely considered whether it's 
whether it's true or not, that's widely considered to be like the, the touchstone L7 record, right? Like if you're going to, mm-hmm. when people think like, oh, there's only one record to listen to, you know, listen to this. And I, I do think it's a fantastic record. I actually think that uh, the one after that, I think Hungry for Stink is probably equally, equally as good. I think they're both fantastic records. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Did you know that L7 was also the first band out on Epitaph Records? I did not know that. No, really. Yeah, a lot of people that. don't know that. So not a lot of people know that. There were two bands that Brett Gerwitz put out on Epitaph kind of simultaneously, and one was a local band called The Little Kings that were mm-hmm. great, and then another, and another, <laughs> and the L7 record that was just called L7. Yeah, that, that was the, uh, you did that tour with Bad Religion, right? If I, yep, if in I 1988. Yeah, like pretty early on. And, mm-hmm. huh, that's interesting. No, I did, I, I do, I do have a... And one of my biggest regrets in life was I took one of those Pixel camcorders on that tour. The PXL 2000? Yeah. And I still have those tapes, and I'm not exactly clear on who to send them to to get transferred, yeah. but I think they've degraded, so I'm sad. Because I'm really, really good at archiving, and I feel that way. I, I missed it. Have you ever talked to Ian Mackay about his archives? No, but... I guess I can break the news. He's coming on the show like either next week or week after next. And I, I heard it was excited. on Fugazi Fridays next Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Who's talking? I'm, Who's talking? <laughs> I'm, I'm talking my team of me. Good. That's and, a, that's awesome. Yeah, we're, we're going to try to do some try to do some synergy. Uh, it's it's yeah. Uh, so one of the things that I think that a project. So this may just be one nerd to another, but that he's working on that is so incredible and I'm not exactly sure if he has entire bigger vision on it. So I, I don't know, but he told me, he didn't say don't tell anybody, but he is <laughs> transcribing uh, phone message tapes that they received. Oh, and, I mean, as a historian, yeah. that's what I want to hear. Yeah. Like that's the stuff I want to hear. And I have my tapes. I still have all my tapes, my because like and those machine, are one of the last things like answering a, machine yeah, messages yeah, yeah. yeah and um oh man <laughs> of course he's just it's like i've had this idea you know i've had this idea to do this and he and, and it's, he's just going to blow it away yeah but you yeah. know what i probably have kurt cobain leaving so there you bam no, yeah just boom <laughs> how you like me now <laughs> how do you like me now but uh but i i just feel like the way we left messages for each other is so compelling and interesting as someone who wants to study media it's interesting that's awesome well i'll i'll, I'll definitely bring that up when we talk because i've been wanting to have him on for years and it's just it's been ships in the night and what i what i really want to do is oh what the hell is he doing all day come on <laughs> what are we all doing all day right now that the record him and amy with um with joe all day well, it's prob- a great probably record. Not all day, yeah. <laughs> I love it. One of the great pleasures of the the reunion of uh, L Seven has you know the um, being able to reunite with crew from back then and from oh, Fugazi's sure. crew and uh, people that are rock stars in their own right, like Pete Stahl, who we've toured with, and Wool. He was in Scream with Dave Grohl. We currently work with him on a professional level. They're still part of the family, even though they're not on stage playing music. You know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I'm not exactly sure, like how in you know the everyone's participation. If it wasn't like that, do you know what I mean? That it is still a family currently. Yeah, that doesn't change. It just uh, it doesn't change. Time marches on, but that doesn't change. Absolutely. So. We we still we other than referencing the documentary, which I, which I suppose is valid. We still haven't talked anything about uh, Bricks or Heavy. I think that that's it's it's interesting that that's to me that's a record that inspired a lot of folks. Uh, it, it put you on a lot of folks' maps that maybe didn't know uh, from before. You've mentioned not a disdain for recording, but like maybe like not it being your favorite thing. Like, did you find that working with Butch and doing that record was that a good process overall? <laughs> such a, a, how do people answer these questions when you have other artists on do they have like just this like nicely curated bit of information that they know your audience will be interested in that like expresses no, 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 their no. own experience well it's not like a void comp test there's no correct answers i mean you know it's like are you sure <laughs> are you sure there's no correct there's answer a, there's a turtle in the desert it's on its back 
<laughs> Do you know that when I was I was dating for years, that was my opening question on Tinder. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> No, I love you right now. I love you right now. <laughs> You're walking through a desert. There's a turtle. You see a little boy. He has a fly in a jar. <laughs> exactly. Why aren't you doing anything? It's like, what? 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 <laughs> <laughs> Turn the desk over. So the... Do your audience must know at this point that we're referencing Blade Runner. It's, we're referencing Blade Runner. Yeah, I would and it was, certainly hope anyone listening to this show would understand that that's Blade Runner. Yeah, but, but maybe not. Maybe, but I, just I, in case I, you I bring, don't. I bring the yeah. young. I bring the young in, honey. That's they true. Come that's with true. Me. Don't um, want to assume. And the reason that it's significant is because it was the line of questioning that a detective would use to discover an android right. or a. And, and, and if a life uh, simulation, because you're checking for emotional response, you're listening to emotion and compassion. compassion. Yes. Right. But did you know, have you ever read do androids dream of electric sheep? I know uh, you want to talk about bricks are heavy, but we're just going to talk about this for a second. <laughs> it's one of my favorite books of all time. Yes. What the concept is of mercerism is missing from the movie, which I think is the only thing that I understand why they dropped it. Cause you could basically have a whole another movie in and of itself just of mercerism. But what is that? Uh, that's the thing where there's it's it's kind of like this religion that they have, but it's also like a TV program sort of thought experience where there's uh, this this fella that's um, it's almost like the Sisyphus thing where you know Sisyphus always like rolling up the hill and okay okay now I remember Got yeah it. Got and, it. and and it's really key to the do androids dream of electric sheep story because it's like this is this is like replaced. Uh, religion like it's technology based religion where it's sort of like almost like a virtual reality right. and people experience uh, Mercer's uh, journey uh, right. as they go through this but it's also like there's a lot of story to tell just with the replicants and stuff I get why they were like uh, maybe right right maybe you not could go. so much <laughs> so this is growing up I have had an impression of what that story was about my whole life and have never heard anybody agree on this Okay. So clearly I'm mentally ill, but I felt when I read it, when I was young, that it was about what would happen to society if we no longer had animals. Yes, because that's a key, a key point of the book where it's like the whole thing, right. the dream of electric sheep. It's like the, <laughs> the, the, you have these beasts, but they're like robot beasts. Yeah. They're yeah. Like, and what do animals mean to us as humans in our right. life? And how far are we going to go to destroy the earth that can't support animal life what's that going to mean and how's that going to affect society yes that's so a, it's a great book to read for this day and age philip k dick talk with jennifer and conan thanks for coming to it now <laughs> <laughs> no it's i mean it's i'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan and and to, to answer the overall question you asked me of me referencing the void comp test uh, no, there is no correct answer to any of that uh, i, I just, for, as a formative record i like to hear what people's experiences are with the recording of the record. Like, you know, did, did you, did you find it to be a good process? It was like, yeah, we had fun. We recorded some songs. Boom. There you go. Or it was, you know, was it something where, where there are challenges? Is there anything noteworthy other than the fact that the indie rock well, gold rush happened like exactly at the yeah, same yeah, time? Yeah. I think like, it's a lot of the stuff that you would still expect that it was a time when being physically in a room together grew a sound and grew the songs you know people um each writer would come in with different like riffs or parts or they would say like i have a verse and a chorus or i have and we would uh, kind of all grow it together so it ha but we were not necessarily like a, like i know that other artists will just come in with a single riff and play it over and over and let that grow we did have a little bit more structure in that sense you know, and then producers would come in maybe after we really developed the song structure at L7. Everyone in L7 has an amazing sense of strong structure, of melody, cohesiveness, how to pull stuff together. So then producers would come in and maybe give some suggestions here and there. But there wasn't a lot of room, really, for them to change up. But also the producers we worked with were very like-minded anyway. Yeah, because you already, you already were a very powerful band that had 
good songs. So it's, yes. more, it's more just a matter. There's <laughs> you don't you don't necessarily right. need to add string sections to it, right? You know. But a lot of times when people would ask us that question in interviews, so if I seem a little bit like I'm kind of curating the conversation, a lot of people were curious to know like who wrote the songs because we come from an era where oh, bands were put okay. together. Yeah, um, maybe yeah, the musicians yeah. didn't even meet each other until the studio. Um, it was maybe a central uh, Svengali style central focus person. Sure. Yeah. Um, so people were always very to me like, how do you write songs? You write a song. You sit down with somebody. You blah, 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 You maybe do a little demo. You listen to it for a couple of days. You rewrite it a bit. You know. But there's lots of other ways to do it, and that was really big for the '90s of these in the pop world specifically. You know, remember, 07 came from a time where women did not write their own music. It right. didn't even matter who, I don't care who you're even talking about. If you wanted to be successful, you used songwriters. And one of the funnest things that I used to love doing back in those days was go to, if there was a management office or a P.O. box, and listen to the submissions of other songwriters who were like, I can make 07 huge. <laughs> I'm going to make you stars. Yes. <laughs> and they'd play their like song that they did in their home, I mean, in their home studio, like on piano with their vocal, you know, talking about whatever. And it, I loved it. It was one of my joys. And not in a mean way. I just loved that people thought that they knew what we needed to do. Like, I just loved that. Right. They wanted to help. They wanted to attach themselves. <laughs> they wanted to help. Exactly. They wanted to help. <laughs> let's, let's go and let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they wanted to help. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Well, and that, yeah, and you bring up an important point, and and I I I didn't mean to you know dance past that at at all. That you know you were pioneers with that, and that's something where I think it's you know some modicum of progress <laughs> has now been made that people don't just assume that it's like this uh, manufactured contrivance with a with a bunch of dude songwriters whenever like a, a new band comes out that's uh, for lack of a better term you know fem- you know uh, populated by female members but there is still like people still consider female fronted a genre which is annoying as hell like i mean there hasn't been th- oh, that much they problems. don't come on come to do. they don't really <laughs> i i still see it and that annoys that annoys me so where it's important. do you see it uh, amongst Where idiots, do you see it? I thought it was clear about that sorry uh it's it's not amongst as common what as idiots to be. i want to go well, there's this thing I want to go the there. <laughs> well, but I guess what I'm saying is I, I feel what like... What Reddit threads are you reading? There, there was a... Rem, I, I feel remiss in sort of a skipping that. And I, I wish that we could. That, that it, it, it's something that... It's annoying. And it's, 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 it's frustrating that that ever would be an artifice that needs to be torn down. But it's, it's frustrating that it's not even completely torn down. Like there's still like this internalized misogyny within music. There's still this patriarchal assumptions about female artists and musicians. And I think we've, we've, the connection with social media has allowed us to circumvent a lot of it, but it doesn't mean that those archetypical constructions are still there. And yeah. And I think the places that women, women have been that's that's my sum totality that it's a bummer (laughs) sorry (laughs) yeah what a show i mean i think that there has been some forward movement in that but you know like it was the gaming industry was really getting concerning concerning because i'm a hardcore gamer i'm a hardcore gamer from pong days like i have never stopped playing video games i play to this day and it's it's a rugged space to be in if you're a developer, if you're creating storyline, if you're a reviewer. We know from Gamergate how that uh, <laughs> S show went down, and that's in your part of the country, I think, huh? Yeah, it's about or it's about ethics and gamer journalism. Sure, yeah, sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, that's ugh. right. But it started like Gross. the narrative of it started the same way that the narrative. Um, you know, of, of the viewpoint of women in rock or hard rock or any kind of like harder or pop music is that you're associated with a masculine male producer. Shouldn't you trying to bring this up that you're with a male producer, that there's a male writer, that somehow you're in this and that the only way that you ever got anywhere is that you're sleeping with somebody. 
Yeah. Oh, it, it, it explains why there's such a fierce ban because, uh, oh, well, so-and-so produced them. So clearly they took a heavy, you know, giving credit, right. unearned right, credit. Right, right, right. Yeah. Which okay. is fine. People can think what they want. I don't care. Like, really, like, there's reality and what, what like, people get so scared. They just kind of go to what they know because the, the change, because change creates grief and no one wants to feel bad. Right. Uh, so you mentioned Garth earlier and the the one after Bricks Are Heavy with uh, Hungry for Stink, which I absolutely love that record as well. The band's in a different place. You've been, you know, touring like crazy as, as L7 does. When you're sitting down and, ri- and writing these songs and, and again, from a perspective of pop sensibility, I think a song like Andre is like just as... Uh, yeah. a fierce and, and immediately catchy and familiar as Pretend We're Dead. Uh, w- making that record, did you, I mean, did you feel like that record came through the way that you had in your mind? Um, you know, do you feel like the songs were, were well represented? What was the whole experience of recording? I should songs? actually go listen to it. <laughs> do you want to take a break and I'll go listen to it? Because uh, I was having trouble remembering some of the, <laughs> the tracks on that one. I mean, that's the one that's got, uh, you know, uh, Feel My Fire, Freak Magnet. Yeah. Um, Talk Box. Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's a bunch okay. of, uh, it's, it's a good, it's a good record. And it's, yeah. I mean, do you remember, what was it? That was, uh, was that Sound City you recorded that? Was that, was it, am I? Yeah, part there? of it was at Sound City and part of it was at A&M. Those oh. are some of the, the, the stories that we tell about being in the studio with the Rolling Stones and Motley Crue were oh. in the same complex and Biohazard. And it was just surreal i had the opportunity to sit in a limousine with keith and his wife at the time while they were doing drugs and actually he wasn't mm. so it was it was one of those things where you, I'm, I'm a person that doesn't do drugs and i i committed to not doing it in like 1990 yeah. and so if you could just imagine the drugs that i missed over those years <laughs> but i think that i always said you know what if keith richards offers me drugs i'm gonna do it yeah I'm going to do it. So I'm sitting in this limousine and his, his wife at the time, God, I shouldn't call these people out. Let's just say some gal that was in the limousine. An unnamed person that was in the, in the car. She was doing it. And she politely, because I think it's polite to to do it, offered it to him. And he said, no. And then to me, and I said, no. And I was just like, Oh, John, come on, keep offering it. Yeah, but that's an invitation by proxy. That is that technically speaking. I know speaking, it doesn't technically you're, count. You're not violating your rule by. Uh, oh, it was so by frustrating. Because <laughs> another like, I've always loved the Everly Brothers. I'm uh, the. Um, oh my God, I can't even tell the story. Never mind. I'm not going to tell it. Well, the Everly Brothers are great. I'm now I'm curious. They are great. With that, but <laughs> there was a whole Everly Brothers thing. <laughs> Because what I just said, and I'm so embarrassed, and this is why I need to really get it together before I talk about historical stuff. I'm talking about the Neville brothers. I loved the Everly brothers, but um, the Neville brothers, one of the Neville brothers' son was in there recording as well with the Rolling Stones. And to me, that was like when his dad came in, Aaron, I was blown away like that's the first time in my life i've ever been like oh guy in my names i don't know i have to go to the bathroom <laughs> like that was the only time and i've met like carl perkins i've met jerry lee lewis yeah. i've met patty smith i've met the ramones i've met the clash um uh, i've met steve jones <laughs> you know i've met everybody anybody who i've met i have felt uh camaraderie and a part of the team Except for Aaron Neville. I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. Oh. Yeah, so there you go. Well, you know, there's there's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it, uh, this is this is a wild pivot, but I really wanted to talk about the uh, Brats on the Beat tribute. I think that's so interesting. Yay! Thank you so much for acknowledging it, because it was really something in my life that I worked hard on. Uh, it was for a cause that I really believed in, and it was an opportunity for me to really show up and show my production skills and how to do it on, like, a shoot, how to do a budget and how to contact people and how to do contracts. Like I was, It was really my first in, and um, it was a record that came out for St. Jude's Hospital on Cargo. Was that- Go Cargo. Uh, it was on go go kart, yeah, yeah, and this is like See, a... yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. one of and them. We took a... <laughs> it came out in American League. 
Yeah, uh, 2006, Ramones, I think, something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, it was basically a prototype punk rock karaoke, kind of. Yeah. Like, we had a Ramones cover band, and I invited a uh, bunch of people to come and yeah, do the vocals. Jack Grisham, you had Blag, yep. uh, all, all kinds of different folks. Uh, I think I mm-hmm. think, Matt Skiba. Or something too. Oh, yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. Matt Skiba. I mean, it was, it was so great, and it was so great working with all these people, and it was so great being in this position where I could call, like, Matt Skiba, or I could call Jack Grisham, and say we have this thing and, and really actually see how they kind of work, like what they do, yeah. like what they need to show up in a studio. And and it was so great to sit there and actually literally direct and produce and, you know, like, yeah. and your pitch and, you know, timing and, you know, really yeah. talk about that with other musicians, which was a chance I never... I never got to have. I produced another record of a band at that time called Kicking Horse, and they opted to um, leave music. They decided they didn't want to produce it, and it's it's a great record. They're a Swiss band that were around in the 90s, and they did a record with Noah Shane, was the producer, who's another L.A., great L.A. producer, and um, I helped them write the songs and all this stuff. And it was a great record. And they just decided that they didn't want to play music and they never really did that much after that. Yeah. It was interesting. Like they were proud of the record and they loved it, but they didn't, they, they got to take, like they're from a small town. It's kind of like you're taking that thing. You like, you find the the kids, right? You find Mm -hmm. the kids and you, you help them realize like the voice that they want to have and you bring them to Hollywood and, you know, like, here's the budget and this is what you're spending. And then you're, you're going to shop it and here's what you're going to do with it. Yeah. And they were like, you know what? This is dumb. We don't want to be a part of this. And you're just like, huh? Wait, what? Really? What? <laughs> what? We all just did this for, we just, there's for a nothing. Lot of, this didn't, yeah, this didn't. You just spent three months at my house. Got a lot of work. Floor. Yeah. <laughs> well, th- but there's, it's not exactly the same thing, but there's folks that I've talked to on the show that when they've talked about leaving music and they just, had this moment that they like nope i'm done and they just they just knew that they were done and that that was yeah that was it and i like, don't know what that feels like i, I don't know what that feels, feels like, like either but the only thing i know how to say is i'm gonna take a nap i'll be back in three years <laughs> yeah exactly you put a pause take a break sure but yeah just yeah they they, they knew that whatever uh, you know drove them in the first place uh, you know, it, it wasn't the same anymore. It wasn't there, like you know, whatever. And it's rare, but I, I've I've talked to multiple parties that have have said that, and that always. I mean, I think that's fascinating as well because I just I don't understand that personally. But it's, mm-hmm. it's you know, props for them for knowing, I guess. Yay! Uh, back to the. Yeah, I used to have this back in the yeah back in the two thousands. My favorite era. I used to have this theory where people would look back and they'd say like, "Oh, the greats of punk rock, bad religion," <laughs> and I'd be like. Well, here's the deal. If you don't quit, you just take breaks and you're the last human standing, then you literally will be the one that will represent that genre. (laughs) Exactly. So just don't, like, and and it's a good rule for life. Like, when you're sick of something, don't quit. Just take a break. That's good. That's that's great. Wisdom. And look who's yeah. talking. Yeah, look yeah. who's talking. I know. I'm saying this be, not because I was ever right or wrong. I'm saying this out of experience. Just ask for a break. So Jennifer, I want to thank you so much for spending so much time with Please. me and having this awesome, uh, very cool, free willing conversation. It's a uh, it's a pleasure, and it's yeah. I, I'm I'm really really psyched that you took the time out to do it. And cool. And just in the shameless plugs, just I have to do it. No, no, absolutely. So, so do that. Make first. sure to I, check out Scatter the Rats. L7 just also released a single called Fake Friends with Joan Jett. It's available on vinyl. You can get it at Kings Road Merch. Kings Road Merch is having a sale on L7 Merch right now. Um, uh, get on my newsletter Jennifer Finch mailing list at jenniferfinch.com uh-huh. yeah. so we can talk. L7 has a, a newsletter list also. And then, of course, all the social media stuff. But as you know, social media is getting a little shady, and a lot of us have backed off of it. Yeah. But I do have an Instagram. But thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. All of that. La- last thing before we go, I want to ask a question. Uh, why do you do what you do? The heroin. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I, I know there's an opioid crisis, and I work every day to help people get off drugs. So 
that's always kind of my joke that nobody ever laughs at. But, you know, you have the the dying, the regrets of the dying, right? Where I should have spent more time with family. I should have pursued my dreams. I should have spent more time playing. I literally will never have any of those regrets because I live such a life well lived. But my tombstone might have to say I should have done more heroin. <laughs> <laughs> That's that, that's a bleakly hilarious answer, <laughs> and I freaking love it. Uh, Jennifer, thank you so much. Thank you so much, and good luck with everything. Me I too. had a good time. Let's be in Bye. touch. <laughs> okay. Oh, there she goes. Freaking Jennifer Finch, man. That was awesome. What a badass. you guys enjoyed that that was a that was a good time and i'm I'm very honored that she chose to uh speak to me and i maybe i didn't make that immediately clear but she doesn't do a lot of interviews so that's uh that's rad so anyway jenniferfinch.com go get on the newsletter find out about that the photozine project open source deal that she was talking about uh, go to I don't know uh, wherever you find your music to go get that last L7 record. Uh, good, it's a good record. I, I listened to it again, uh, like I said yesterday. I think we talked about this, and uh, it's solid, solid record. If you like L7, you will. I feel confident saying you will like this record. 
uh, Scatter the Rats. There's apparently a new single. I wasn't even aware of that with Joe Jett. So, like, hello. That's we're checking out. As we come to the close of our broadcast. Day. Yeah. Uh, what else? Well, I'll tell you. This is my farewell transmission. This show is called Conan Neutron's Protonic Reversal. It airs on Radio Nope. RadioNope.com. Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea. The archives. The sound of my voice. Patreon.com slash Protonic Reversal. Get the episode sooner. One dollar a month will get you there. I've got 50,000 watts of power. All the shows are always free, available wherever you get your podcasts. Just look for Protonic Reversal. Ionize the air. Thanks everyone that shares the show around and talks about it with their friends. Uh, it helps grow the show and helps kind of keep this whole operation moving forward. This microphone turns sound into electricity. Some really cool episodes coming up. Uh, thanks for sticking with me. Can you hear me now? Out on Stay safe out there. The dark and lonely. Take it easy. I got my radio on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the, it's the end of radio. The last announcer plays the last record. The last what? Leaves the transmitter. Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now?
isn't really broadcasting if there's no one there to receive. It's the end of radio. As we come to the close of our broadcast day.